Ah, good morning. Hello. Here we are moving into summertime. School's going to be out soon. Man, all sorts of transition. Um, let's see. I have two things before I jump in. Uh, we have small groups starting this Thursday night. Who's, who's brave enough to say I'm getting in a small group? Anybody? We've got a few hands. Look at that. Okay. Um, if you didn't get in one or have not gotten in one, this Thursday night from 6.30 to 8, I don't know what date this Thursday is. Does anybody know that? The 19th, thank you, from 6.30 to 8 at our office location over off Burnt Mill. Um, we're going to be gathering. I'll be leading that time, and we'll have little breakout small groups. So if you haven't gotten in one yet, you are welcome to come join us there. We'll put you into one, um, and we'll spend an hour and a half together opening up some of the scripture that we're actually opening um, tonight. If you'd like to sign up for a group and you're not in one yet, at the end of the service, just walk out that door, and Cynthia Ross will be out there at the table, and you can get connected. Sound good? Okay. All right. Y'all got to make some noise for me today. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next, what else? Oh, the Saltbox Connect Lunch is after the service today. So if, you've, if you're not, you know, connected here, a member here, you want to find out more, um, we, we do that every month or two, and we take you through how the church got started, what we believe, answer any questions you have, what's the leadership oversight, et cetera, et cetera. So come join us. We've got lunch in the cafeteria um, if you want to do that. If you're online and want to go through that, you're going to have to put it in the text box, and we got to come up with a way to help you through that process. Okay, um, I am in uh, John 7, uh, if you want to open your Bible there. Um, believe it or not, I don't think we're going to cross-reference anything else today. We're just going to sit in John 7. Um, today's, in some ways, a little bit messy. Uh, in other words, I don't have it, like, perfectly organized, but there's something so um, powerful here. So um, I, I want you to actually say with me, Lord Jesus, would you speak to me this morning? Ready? One, two, three. Okay, so one of the things that as we've been going through this book of John <clears throat> that we've been looking at is who Jesus said he was. And I think we've come to the point where we have firmly established that Jesus says, I am. So he's referencing Exodus 3.14 um, and following where God introduced himself to Moses as the great. I am. That's right. So Jesus is equating himself with God. He is saying, I am God in human form. I am God incarnate. So I think we're, we've got that pretty solidly fixed. But I want to pivot today into John 7, um, and we're going to look at what's happening um, behind the scenes, let's say, in Jesus' heart, in Jesus' mind. Because starting here in John 7, he begins this, this tragic downworld. Uh, it, it's both tragic and it's victorious, but he gets the, begins this tragic downward slide where everyone abandons him, and he ultimately ends up dying on the cross for you and me. And so I want us to actually pivot um, almost out of just looking at Jesus as God, and I want us to pivot into um, knowing the God Jesus knew. Okay? So, so the question that we're going to sort of wrestle with and even look at today is we've established Jesus is God. Okay, he is Yahweh God in human form, but we're going to pivot into how can we know the God Jesus knew? Okay, and this becomes so important because um, how many of you know out of what you believe in your heart and even think in your mind, it fuels what you feel and it ultimately fuels what you do, right? You hear what I'm saying? So, so out of, like, in, in fact, if you take any of us as humans and you stick us in a difficult or painful or frustrating situation, guess what's going to come out? What's really there? That's what's going to come out. And I think in those most difficult situations is where we really betray, or maybe betray is not a good word, it's revealed what's really in our heart. Um, <clears throat> there's actually something that, um, I don't even know if I can find it here in my notes, but there's something that um, A.W. Tozer um, actually wrote about um, and, he, and he talked about. I cannot even find it. But anyway, he, he, he talks about being a practical atheist. Okay, a practical atheist is where you're able to read the Bible and look at the past and go, man, God is real. I believe in him. And you're able to even read Revelation and look to the future and know God is 
real. I believe in him. But what begins to happen is you actually in the moment by moment, day to day, you live as if God is a father who doesn't care, is disconnected, is not leading you, and you're unable to access and abide in his person and presence. I do that some days. Do you? So the question then becomes, how do we as people begin to engage and understand and know the Father or the God that Jesus knew? So let's, let's speak even to human transformation just a minute. Um, when God comes in, I talk a lot about surrendering your life to Jesus. When God comes in and you give your life to Jesus, you exchange your broken life for his righteous life, um, what happens is inner transformation. We could look at the Old Testament. There was something where uh, the guy named King Saul, um, when God came upon him, it actually says he got a new heart. Okay, we could look at Ezekiel, we could look at Jeremiah, and they talk about when God comes, you receive, he replaces your heart of stone with a new heart. So you get this idea of this new heart. So when we, when we come to Jesus, um, we can access supernaturally and instantaneously kind of a newness of heart, all right? But there's a secondary process of transformation that I'm going to try to invite us into as we look at, at the God Jesus knew this morning. Um, but it is a more like practical um, process of transformation. So, so here's what it looks like. If you can change the stories in your head about who God is. In other words, when we open the Bible every week, we don't just come together for me to tell you a funny story or a cool story or something else. No, no, no. We actually are opening the Bible, and the whole idea is that we would be getting to know this God, and if we can begin to think differently about our lives, believe differently about our lives, believe differently about him, then we're not just waiting for this angry God to do something bad again to us. You hear what I'm saying? But instead, we're now positioning ourselves to look for what this gracious, kind, gentle, joy-filled, patient Father is drawing us into. So, so a lot of us, if we're really honest, we're sitting around waiting for something bad to happen, right? You're just, you're just, we're just waiting for something else and some big shoe to drop and God to tell us he's angry and disappointed. And it's like what I'm attempting, and I think what Jesus is attempting to invite us as people into, is this idea where you're able to reform your view of who God is as a father, let him even retool how you see him in your heart so that when you get in an experience or a situation, it might be good, it might be difficult, it might be challenging, it might be scary, that you begin to respond to that out of this belief that there is this good father Father that loves you and wants the best for you, even if it's a painful situation. You follow me? So that's kind of what we're sort of wrestling with here. So if you can begin, the, 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 there's supernatural transformation of heart. Yes, absolutely. There's a second, more natural transformation of heart that I think has to do with changing the way you believe or, or even think about Jesus and God. Um, and then you begin to engage in some new practices, and then you begin to engage in a journey in some new practices and things with a group of people. That's what we're trying to accomplish even in small groups, Okay. So that's how there's supernatural transformation, but there's also this natural sort of transformation. Um, let me open it for you like this before we start reading. We're going to start reading in, in John 7, verse 1. Let me invite you into a story that's happening into, in my home, in my heart. And it keeps, um, it's this story that I just, it's like God just keeps beckoning me deeper to understand him more um, than I ever have. And, and, and here's what's happening. Um, I first became a dad at like 23. And you're just, at 23, you're just, just too young to be a dad. I'm, I mean, you're not, but I'm so glad I'm... I'm a dad again at 41. Like, it's just really, really good. And uh, I, I, it's like I know him better. Not perfectly, but better. And so I'm reflecting him, I hope, more accurately to my little ones. You follow me? So um, Amelia uh, is our four-year-old. And Amelia knows that daddy gets up early. And five days a week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, daddy is up and I am gone. Nobody, even, I mean, I'm gone. It's still dark out. Nobody, they don't see me in the morning. Like, I'm gone. The beautiful part about that is by about four o'clock every day, guess what? I am home, man. We are riding scooters and skateboards and having a big time, and I'm hanging out and having dinner with them almost every night of the week. But there's two days, uh, Saturday morning, or excuse me, Friday morning and Saturday morning, when I try to be at home. 
And Amelia knows that uh, in the morning, I get up early, and I, I often sit at our dining room table. Now, those of you who know me and have heard me, what am I doing? I'm reading my one-year Bible, right? Because before I begin my whole thing, what's, I want to hear from him, right? I'm writing in my five-year journal. Sometimes I'm putting my little earbuds in and I'm worshiping. I'm actually inviting him to interact with me, to set my course for the day, to redeem and restore and heal and all the stuff, right? And I'm just in, this, in my own Jesus journey. And Amelia has gotten to the point where she knows that on that Friday morning and Saturday morning, the days I, I try to take off, um, that daddy's going to be sitting out at the dining room table. And so she'll get up um, expectant, and she comes out, and she wants a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, and, the, and this is what a, a million cup of coffee is. It's about uh, two and a half percent coffee and about 97 and a half percent milk. But it's, it's coffee. And she comes out there, and we, it's like she can't wait. And there's some days where I'm like, how can you be this excited about getting up early to sit with me. Now, come on, go there a second. So the other day, um, she got up and I had, uh, she knew that I was going to be there. It was Friday morning and the yellow truck was going out uh, that particular Friday morning. And so I had to get up real early and move my truck out of the driveway and I parked it down the street and then I pulled the yellow, yellow truck out for somebody. And I went in and instead of sitting at the dining room table, I went to a little upstairs spare bedroom office we have and I was sitting in my office working. So Amelia got up and she came out expecting to see dad where? And guess what? Dad wasn't. She goes into mom and starts crying. Abby texts me, and I immediately sent her a photo of me sitting at the office. So she comes running upstairs. We got her little coffee. We got out. We, we read the Jesus Storybook Bible together. And she and I just sat there, and we're just spending time with one another, alongside one another, talking and reading the Jesus Storybook Bible. And I'm sitting there absolutely gripped with, oh, Father, if only, not just me, but if we as a church of believers could come to the point where the longing of our heart is to arise and to awaken and to sit with our father and to know him as daddy God and to know him as one who goes before us, who protects us, who even if our kids get something that we don't understand or we're wrestling with a disease or we lose someone or no matter what happens in our lives, that he has something good, not just for uh, his good, but for our good in it and then his glory. And so the, the question that just has been like beckoning inside of me is, Father, can I get to the point? It, it's already like my favorite part of the day in the morning. But I'm going, okay, can I get to the point where the purity that I see in this little girl, the sheer delight to come and sit with me, and I'm tempted to go, why would she want to sit with me? Now hear that? So I got an identity issue right there, right, that I got to get sorted out with who? My God. So I get that sorted out with him, and then I'm fully able to engage with her. Now, if we as a church and a body of believers can come to the point where we, with everything in us, can't wait to get up just to sit in his presence. You hear me? If we began to see him as so good, even in the pain, even in the difficulty, that if we began to know that we know that we know, like beyond our feelings, way down deep into our believing, then I think when these things happen to us that feel terrible, that we would respond out of this revelation that he has such good things in store for us. Now listen to me. This is not um, like the prosperity gospel, okay? I'm not saying he wants to make you rich, he wants to bless you, and blessing is sitting in the presence with your daddy. You hear me? That's it. It's taking your place as a daughter, taking your place as a son, taking your place in that spot, and walking with him and learning to abide with him moment by moment, day by day, throughout the day. That's peace. You can't buy peace. In fact, you can like look around and so few people have real peace. You know what I'm saying? So few people have like real genuine joy. Like when someone really smiles at you, not like, a, not like I'm taking a picture smile, but like a real smile, you're like, oh, joy. You know what I'm talking about? You hear me? I mean, what God is even calling us to as believers is this experience with him that is so deep that our joy is genuine, our hope is genuine, our peace is genuine. And man, when all that stuff's in order, it doesn't matter what's happening. You hear me? Okay, so let's embark um, 
We're going to tiptoe into this. Lord, transform us supernaturally once and for all. But Lord, also transform us practically today um, by the renewing of our hearts, by the renewing of our minds, and allow us to begin to tell ourselves more accurate stories about who you are as Father. Okay, let's read. John 7. After this... Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. Do you feel insecure today? Can you imagine how insecure Jesus felt? And what's he clinging to? Like dig beneath. Who's the God that Jesus knows in this moment? You hear me? Like, go dig deeper into it and even think about there's people that are after him to kill him. We get upset when people cut us off in traffic or make fun of us or are sarcastic to us, right? How many of you have had somebody after you to kill you? Really? This is the God, the God that Jesus knew. Is he's, he's entrusting himself fully to this gracious God. Okay, keep going. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, and the Jewish festival of tabernacles was a remembrance where all the Jews came together. There's probably some two million people gathering in, in Jerusalem. Um, but they're coming together. They're actually living in tents to remember the transition from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. The new Moses is now here. He is inviting them to transition from the slavery of their old way into the freedom and peace and joy and hope of new life in him. That's kind of the backdrop. Verse 3, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. Now, these are Jesus' younger brothers, okay? No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even, look at this, for even his own brothers did not believe him. I don't know about you, but I think rejection is one of the most painful things on earth. Yeah? You get rejected inadvertently, you know? Like, go back to me and Amelia. Dad's busy and doesn't have time for me. What does that feel like to Amelia? Come on, call it rejection. Jesus is here in this moment, and he's being rejected by his earthly brothers. Tell me about the God Jesus knows. So in this moment, Jesus is being hurt and rejected by his earthly brothers. I'm pretty sure if I was in Jesus' shoes, I just bailed out on the whole thing right there. I'm done. They hurt my feelings. Abby and I laugh at my house because I tend to be oversensitive. True. True ask her. She'll tell you. So Jesus is being actively and adamantly rejected by the people, by the religious people, now by his own brothers to the point that they actually want to kill him. Okay, verse 6. Therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. Okay, is Jesus' time his own? Whose time is it? That's the thing that I think we're actually attempting, um, even in this idea of like practicing his presence or understanding the purpose of God and the interaction of God in our daily life, is we're actually beginning to go, Lord, would you make it so my time isn't even my own? Oh, some of us are time controllers, aren't we? I've got an appointment, and as soon as we have another appointment, what happens? Your eyes glaze over, your ears close, and we're on, you know, come on. Okay, so so Jesus is connected, and he's so connected with this God that even though he's being rejected humanly, um, he's at a point where they want to kill him humanly. What's he know about God? All right, what's he know about his father? Come on. Father's with him. What else? Father loves him. All right, what else? Father's perfect. Yeah, what else? 
He's got a purpose. He's got a plan. He's got a timing. So no matter what it looks like in a human perspective and level, somehow Jesus, even as in his humanity, is able to put his kingdom of God glasses on and go, oh my goodness, God's got a time. And I am choosing to surrender my life to it and rest in it and wait for it. And not only that, I am going to wait for the leading of him to go up to the feast. The time isn't yet. Okay. Verse 12. No, verse, verse 10, excuse me. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Verse 12, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said he's a good man. Others said he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly out of fear of the leaders. Verse 14, not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up into the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Where's Jesus' source? How is it that in the face of adversity, how is it that in the face of rejection, how is it in the face when every human is turning their back on Jesus, and some of you can identify with this, but how is it that Jesus is able to so know this loving, gracious, kind Father, and he, he somehow is able to know deep inside his heart so that when he's in the heat of the emotional moment and he's tempted and he's discouraged and he wants to give up and say, I don't believe anymore, that he continues on. I mean, how powerful is this? The God Jesus knew is so powerful in this moment that everyone is turning on him. And he says, my teaching is not my own. You get that? I mean, it's like you, you, you probably couldn't tell Amelia anything right now. She's four and I'm still perfect in her eyes. Isn't that great? When they hit teenagers, guess what happens? You're highly imperfect, and every imperfection gets under like the magnifying glass, and you know, it's just, it's the journey. And it keeps us humble, and it keeps us dependent, and it keeps us honest, and it keeps us true. But you got this, you got, if you could not go to Amelia and convince her by anything you told her that her daddy didn't love her. You hear me? But somehow we depart this childlike faith. And I don't even know where it happens. But we get in the messy business of church. And what always happens in church? We get our feelings hurt. The pastor lets us down. Somebody on the worship team hurts our feelings. Come on. Somebody didn't let me carry the thing right. I mean, it, it, it is the messy business of church. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Somebody say, yes, Michael, we know. Yes, it's a mess. And so we give up, not just on church. So we give up on people, but then we give up on God. And, and for some of us, when things get difficult or when, when people turn sort of against us or on us, um, we actually begin to rewrite and and see God through a different um, artificial or wrong lens. Some of you who've been abused by a dad, physically, sexually, verbally. Some of you have been abused by a mom, physically, sexually, verbally. Some of you have been abused by a person in authority. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, those things where we've been most hurt by someone who's in authority over us, what do we do? We're going to cast it on God. And we're going to project that thing on him. So we're just waiting for him to like hurt us beat us up, put us in a bad spot. You hear what I'm saying? But Jesus is so confident, um, and, and what we see here in this verse 16 is he's so confident, not just in who he is, he's confident in what he's saying because he knows who? God. The whole point of the Gospels, the whole point of Jesus even coming and walking on earth as a human, living life just like we did, is that he could actually help us understand and know how to relate to God. So the whole study, even of John, the whole thing that we're in right now, every time we come to church, is an attempt to sort of retool and grasp who this loving Father God is so that we can depart from this place and as we go do life, that we can navigate under this greater revelation of the kindness and endless love of this Father who is not out to get us, he's actually out to help us. He's out to bless us. He's out to keep us. He's out to protect us. And sometimes he uses really difficult, painful situations to get us to the place we need to go for our good and for his glory. You hear me? 
And so it's not going to be easy. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, everything's going to be great. No, no, no. But what I'm saying is, if you can wait quietly and patiently and look through the situation and begin to find him in it, he will find you and his goodness will shine through every time. So the first thing is we see Jesus' time is not his own. We see that Jesus is, even when he's rejected, he's got this rock-solid revelation of who this loving father is, and so he's going to cling to him and depend upon him. We got this um, really confident um, message that Jesus gives, and he's so confident in who he is, and he's so confident in this message because of the one who sent him. Let's keep reading. Verse 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Uh, Let me depart here for just a second because this is both terrifying and powerful. Let's read this again. I'm in the NIV. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So what if you don't choose the will of God? Come on, what happens? Reverse it. If you, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. What if you don't choose to do the will of God? You don't know. Oh, Jesus, help us. There's an invitation here uh, to each of us as people to not only do the will of God, but to begin to practice his presence and find him in it. It's like there is something so powerful here that Jesus does because as he is navigating, he's also inviting the entire country of Israel uh, to join him in this and knowing who this great Yahweh God is. Let's keep going. Verse 18, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. So what's Jesus' goal? Glorify God. But you got to understand, some of us say the right answer. My goal is to glorify God and worship him forever or whatever. But when you begin to grasp how good this God is, how kind this God is, how gracious this God is, how loving this God is, you can't help but want to glorify him. You hear me? It's not like something you're working up. It's an it's an overflow. Like it's 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 from this um, it's it's from this absolute overflow. So we could all probably go around the room and talk about times when we've tried to glorify ourselves. Yeah, come on, be honest with me. And we could probably all go around the room too and talk about times where we've sat under pastors or preachers or saw people and what are they trying to do? Come on. This powerful verse. Whoever speaks on their own does, uh, does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Jesus so knows, the God Jesus knew is so kind and gracious that his entire aim is to glorify his Father. Verse 19, has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? This is a wild verse to me. Verse 20, you are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? All right, what's happening here? The the crowd uh, up at the temple, they're they're in the temple at this point. The crowd um, is, is probably even in some level of denial that people are trying to kill him. It's secret, it's hidden, but people are talking everywhere, and the crowd isn't even willing to acknowledge it. And then Jesus opens sort of this next sentence. Let's look at this together. Um, So I guess just a review, Um, Jesus' time is not his own because he so trusts this good father. Uh, Jesus' message is not his own because he so trusts this kind, loving, and gracious father. Um, Jesus' goals are not his own. It's not to glorify himself, but it's to glorify God. Um, And then, let's keep going. 
<clears throat> has not Moses, verse 19, given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? Verse 20, you're demon possessed. Verse 21, Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, he's saying it came from Abraham, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? And then he gives this hard rebuke. Stop judging by mere appearances and start judging correctly. What is Jesus saying there when he says, judge correctly? Dig here just a second. Like, hang in and go here. What is he saying when he says, judge correctly? He's actually saying, understand the gracious, kindness, loving nature of a holy father and stop looking at everything at face value and begin to look past it, in it, and through it and take whatever situation you are actually in as an invitation from a sovereign, holy, loving father for you to take the next steps into greater dependence, intimacy, and connection with him. You follow me? Let me give you a silly example from our life the last two weeks. Um, we live in a neighborhood that way. And uh, one day, um, we just planted these new plants, okay? And I'm a landscaper. I love dirt. I love plants. I love being outside. I could just probably live outside forever. Um, and I, we planted this new live oak tree, and I made this really nice, um, like, uh, tree ring around it to hold water. And Abby was out there just being awesome, watering our new plants, right? And so she's over here watering the new plants. And up from the tree ring, come on. Yeah, about a three and a half foot snake pops up. Now, my wife does not like snakes. I don't like snakes, but my wife threw the hose and ran. I mean, she hates snakes. Later that day, we get in the car. She's panicked. She doesn't even want to leave the house, right? I'm telling on you, Abby. Uh, we leave the house, we're driving um, just out right past our house, and someone has run over a snake, and they've gotten out of the car, and they've picked it up, and they're holding it like this off the ground. I kid you not, same day. How big is that snake? And then I didn't tell her this. She's going to really get me this afternoon. But I didn't tell her this, but later that afternoon, I was leaving again, and guess what I did? I ran over one. Three. Three. Now, I'm, this, is, this is both silly and it's tongue-in-cheek, but I want you to grasp something here. Like, find it for a second, okay? I get before the Lord, and I'm like, Father, I am really frustrated. Like, Abby's never going to leave the house again. I mean, really. Like, she's never, I mean, like, I love the yard. I love to be outside and all the stuff with the kids. I'm, we're always out there doing something. I'm never going to get my wife in the yard again. And I, I had this little nudge of, Michael, what if you began to look at even this type of difficulty as my initiation into Abby's life to allow her to step in, through, and past and see me as this loving, kind, and gracious father that wants to reach her and draw her into deeper, intimate connection with him? You hear me? How, much, how many times as roommates, as friends, as spouses do we spend protecting the people we love the most from the very thing that God has put into their lives or allowed into their lives to draw them into deeper connection with him? You hear me? Like how many times has God allowed something painful, difficult, or disappointing, and if you'll engage him on a deeper level, you don't have to protect God. He's good. You don't have to. You can actually courageously begin to go, Lord, I don't understand why this has happened and I don't like it. Would you help me see from your perspective? Like that is a totally fair question. And if I'm doing anything here as we get together and preach and share Jesus, it's to let you and help you and help me as people to step into a more full, deep interaction with this loving, gracious Father. You hear me? Come on, that's worth contending for, church. Because if we can begin to get him right in our hearts, in our thinking, the way we see him, then all of a sudden the way we feel, the way we respond, what we say, what we do, everything changes. Everything changes. Jesus is rebuking this crew because they're judging incorrectly. And a lot of us religious people go, well, they should have done this and they should. What he's saying is judge and see from the lens of a kind, gracious, loving father. If you can circumcise and cut something off of a little boy on the Sabbath, why in the world can't I heal on the God that came to heal? 
I'm the God that came to restore. I'm the God that came to give life. I'm the God that came to raise up. I'm the God that came to bless. I'm the God that came to further your life, not diminish or take away from it. This is the essence of what God is saying in this moment. Let's keep going in verse 25. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? So it's now leaked out, all right? They're trying to kill Jesus. Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he's the Messiah? So what are the people saying? They're actually uh, sort of in reverse saying, well, by what the authorities are not doing, they're saying to us that he is the Messiah. That's what they're concluding here. But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Okay, they're talking about Bethlehem. So no one knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Everybody thought Jesus was from Nazareth. What I love about Jesus is he didn't tell anybody. See, in the Old Testament, everyone knew that the, that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem. Well, Jesus grew up in, and he never straightened it out. I love this Jesus. I lost my place. Verse 27, verse 28. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out. By, by the way, this is really cool. We're going to see it here in a minute. But he's teaching in the part of the temple that women were allowed right now. Really, I love Jesus. Um, he didn't go. There's an outer court area. It's called the treasuries. And, and so women, children, everyone is allowed in this part of the temple. And he is strategically posted up. And he's teaching in a place, even declaring, all people are welcome. There is no longer Greek or Jew, male or female, slave or free. All are one in Jesus. Love, love this Jesus. But we, uh, verse 28, then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, yes, you know me and you know where I'm from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me, again, look at his identity. Look at his identity. I am not here on my own authority. I'm here on the, on the authority of God. I'm here. I can't do my glasses and my microphone. I got to work on that. Sorry. I'm, I'm not here on my own authority. He's, he's acknowledging um, I'm, I'm here sent on the authority of this gracious, kind, and loving Father. But he who sent me is true, and you do not know him. Church, I think that's probably true for most of us today. If I made a bold, scary declaration, I think most of even the American church labors under not truly knowing and believing in this good, kind, gracious, loving Father. And if we did, I think by and large, we'd all be like Amelia every morning. I can't wait to get up and sit with my Father. But I knew him because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him, and they said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this? Again, there's all sorts of hubbub going on here. We could dig into it, but they're arguing over who Jesus is. They're, they're, there's all sorts of gossip happening. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I will go to the one who sent me. Where's Jesus going? heaven. That's right. He's foretelling his crucifixion on the cross. You will look for me, but you cannot find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? When or will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks um, and teach the Greeks? Again, they're, all they're doing is engaging here in some hubbub about where's Jesus going to go. Verse 36, what did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but no one can find me and where I am, you cannot come. All right, let's, let's put the crux of everything right here. Verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and in a loud voice said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Drink what? Let anyone who is thirsty. So Jesus stands up. There's some two million people in Jerusalem. It's a big mess. 
right? Everyone, life is a mess. People are gathered together. He's in the temple. People are literally everywhere. Kids are crying. Sheep are bang. It is like, it is total chaos, okay? People are stinky. They're not wearing deodorant. People are wearing sandals, and some of them are wearing those shoes. And he stands up, and in this big, bold voice, what's he say? Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Drink what? The goodness of God. Drink in the revelation of who this kind, gracious, loving Father is. Because if you drink of this living water, you will never be the same. It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you act. It'll change everything. Because all of a sudden, you will see life from this perspective where you are about your Father's business. You have this loving, kind, gracious Father that is for you. He's going ahead of you. He's going to come behind you. He is the one that loves you. He's saying, come to me and drink. Verse 38, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Okay, so Jesus' identity as the son, I think, is being fully sort of revealed here. And then what's he saying? This is the crux. What's his desire for us as Christians? Come on. What? Flow through you? Okay, what else? Come to him, okay, drink. All right, let him who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will rise up and flow from within you. It's the essence of the entire Christian life. He's saying, come to me and understand the love of this kind, gracious father. Let him dwell inside of you, and then you become part of the overflowing message of the cross and the hope and the life and of Jesus. You follow me? One of the tragedies, I think, right now in the American church, and I'm part of the American church, so I'm part of it. I'm not criticizing it, okay? It's happening, and I'm in it. We're in it. Is that we begin uh, to come up with these formulas and these shows, and they draw people, and we think because they draw people that God is present with them there. And what happens is all of a sudden we become slave to the show and to the performance, and we don't even know that he's not there with us. You hear me? Like it's this, it's this like, uh, uh, it's, it's a holy, almost scary moment because what he is looking for is a group of people who come daily to drink uh, from him and then they become the overflow out of which uh, people around them um, are encounter Jesus. You follow me? Why do so many pastors fall? It's happening all over the place right now. Why? Because at some point, they stop drinking the living water. They become an end to themselves. They stop trying to glorify God. They start trying to glorify themselves. And then all of a sudden, they don't have anything to give. And then what do you, and you don't have anything to give. When your life is not an overflow, what happens? You start to perform. I gotta act this way, I gotta do this, I gotta say this, and if I don't get up here and play the keys this way, then, you hear me? And so this anxiety sets in because you go, I'm not enough, and I'm gonna fail, and I can't do it, and I've got good news for you, church. This is the God who, if you will begin to recalculate what you believe and what you think, this is the God who wants not only you to drink the living water, but he's the God who will actually empower you to be a vessel that brings life. Like, it's so powerful. What if as a church we actually got our heads and hearts around who he was and we actually became life? What if you were life? What if I was life? What if when we rolled, we were just sharing the hope of Jesus, the life of Jesus, instead of cleaning up and trying to perform, right? You hear what I'm saying? Oh, this is so powerful, y'all. Goodness. Father, help us. Okay, let's, let's open a, a final door in this. I think I wanted to read one more little passage. Verse 39, let's just finish that. By this, he meant the Spirit. Who's the Spirit? Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the Trinity. Uh, was part of where the, the um, theology of the Trinity comes from. Whom those who had believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So what is Jesus being glorified? raising from the dead, first of all, and then actually ascending back into heaven. That's the glorification of Jesus. And then he sent the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is the spirit of Jesus, uh, into, and he was released in Pentecost in like Acts 2, I think it is. Okay, so let's go here just a minute. Most of us spend our lives and we get up and our, if we were really honest, our our internal self-talk is something like this. I'm not good enough. 
I can't. They don't like me. Come on, go here just a second. I'm not smart enough. I'm not whatever enough. And we spend most of our time dwelling on what we're not. Now, flip the coin. There's a few of us um, who, for whatever reason, have a flesh pattern, and by flesh I just mean sin pattern, but have a sin pattern that's more superior. And those people cover their I'm not enoughs with this superior thing, and they act like I'm enough, right? But here's what I've discovered. If you dig past that a little bit or the right circumstances arise and you get through that, what do you find underneath it? Deep, broken insecurity. I'm not... Paul's got a place for that. I'm not enough. Now, I want you to be honest with me here for just a second. Worship team's going to come back, and we're going to close here in a couple minutes. Most of us, if we were ruthlessly honest, and small groups are going to be a great place for this if you're courageous enough, but most of us, if we were really, really honest, are working so hard every single day because we feel like we're not enough. You hear me? I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. Now, Jesus has introduced himself in the first six chapters of John as the great I am. Okay, y'all are with me. Say it again. The great I am. I am. I am. Okay. When you give your life to Jesus, where does Jesus live? Hit your chest. Jesus lives here. Amelia said the other day, Daddy, where does Jesus live? Jesus lives here. I am enough. I am. Because of Michael? No, 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 no. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. Michael no longer lives. But who lives? But Jesus lives in me and through me. Listen to me, church. Listen, listen. This is so important. If you get this, you'll never be the same. I am lives inside of you. And you don't have to live under the I'm not and I'm not good enough and I don't measure up and I'm not pretty enough and I don't drive the right car and I don't live in the right neighborhood and I don't have the right job and they're not going to like me and I'm not really funny and I'm bald and you hear me? Like, come on, guys, like lean into this a second with me because the great I am has taken up residency inside of you. This is not semantics. Hear me, this is so important. This is not semantics. This is life transformation in action. All of a sudden, you are the one who opens your eyes in the morning and instead of just pain and anxiety and depression and I don't want to and I hate my job and I can't and blah, 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 all the stuff that goes through our brains, all of a sudden we have this opportunity to run to the Father and to sit with Him and have our little cup of milk and coffee and rest in His presence. And all of a sudden, as we journey through our day, we don't have to labor under the I'm not and I'm not good enough and I'll never be, but we can actually drink deeply of the great I am. And all of a sudden when the great I am is living inside of us, guess what? You and I are, we are enough. We can, we will, we have, because who? Come on, this will change your life. I'm telling you, this will absolutely impact you forever and ever. The great I am lives inside of you. Go back to the words of Jesus. Stop judging by mere appearances and instead judge correctly. I tell you about my morning declaration sometimes. Let me read you my first two sentences. And worship team, if y'all come back out, that'd be amazing. My first two sentences of my morning declarations. I am a beloved son. Isn't that good? That's how I start my day. I'm a beloved son. I am a new creation. Guess what? Old Michael's gone. My father says over me, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Okay, hang on a second. Michael, isn't that heresy? Come on, wrestle that one with me a second. Is it heresy? Who lives in Michael? I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me. Galatians 2.20. 
The great I am lives inside of me. God said over his son, Jesus, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. When you take up your cross, when you surrender your life to Jesus, when he comes and lives inside of you, you are now his son or his daughter and he is pleased with you. Like it's transformational. My third sentence is, my father says over me, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then I say, I have exchanged all my fear. Some of y'all afraid? I've exchanged all my insecurities. I've exchanged all my shame. I've lived under a lot of shame. And I've exchanged all my sin. And I am accepted in Christ. I am significant in Christ. I am secure in Christ. I have been crucified with Christ Jesus and he lives in me and through me. Church, listen to me. I don't care if God makes us a big church or keeps us a small church or does anything in between. I don't care even what we look like or sound like. I don't care what we're called. What I am most interested in is that we as a group of people would come to the place where we recognize that the great I am has taken up residency inside of us. The old us is gone and everything about who you are can be dictated by understanding this loving, kind, and gracious father. And all of a sudden you are enough. All of a sudden you can because he lives inside of you. And if you can get this, no matter what snake pops its head out of your little tree ring and looks at you, you can walk through it with courage and go, I will overcome. I will rise above. I will see beyond. I will look this fear in the face. I will face my insecurity. I will overcome my depression. My body's falling apart and I hate retirement, but I have overcome. You hear me? Come on. This is it. My marriage is going to be restored. My kids are going to come home. This is the great I am that wants to live his life in us and through us. And this is real. This is not semantics. And you as people can access this loving, kind, and gracious God just like I can. I am nothing special. I am no different than any of you. You can access this God. And if we as a church can get a few drops of this judging correctly, understanding correctly, then truly rivers of living water will rise up and flow from within us. And you won't be able to keep unbelieving people away because they're like, that's real joy. That's real peace, that's real hope, that's real life. And there is so few people who have real peace and real hope and real joy and real life. Would you guys as a church join me in saying, Lord Jesus, would you take up residence inside of me in such a way that rivers of living water flow from within me? If I could call pastors everywhere to something today, I would call them back to the reality. You don't have to perform. Surrender under it. Let the Lord Jesus do it in you and through you and let rivers of living water rise up. If I could say anything to you all as a church today, it would be stop trying to hold it all together and control it all and make it all happen. Stop getting up every day and telling yourself, I'm not enough and I'm not good enough and begin to appropriate that he is And therefore, you are. Come on. Come on. If that resonates with you, let's stand together. And some of y'all, just just come up here down front if you want. Let's just say, Lord Jesus, would you touch my heart? Oh, we're singing, lead me to the cross. Isn't that good? Come on. (laughs) Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, would you come and move through this auditorium in such a way, even the people watching online, that you would awaken us to the heavenly reality that you are this good, gracious, kind Father. And Lord, would you do some supernatural transformation, even as we sing this closing song, imprinting on our hearts the reality of who you are in such a way that we're set free from performing and driving and we're no beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're this good Father. Lord, lead us to the cross. Oh, Lord Jesus, we need you. We're so grateful for your presence, for your love, for your pursuit.
Father, let us as people see you as Father, as good, as kind, as gracious. And Father, would you lead us to the cross again and again? Father, do something unique in our lives, in our marriages, with us as dads, as moms, as friends, as roommates, as neighbors. Revive us, O oh God. In your name we pray. Amen. There's a group of people up here who would love to pray with you if you want to linger. Everybody hang for just a minute. Everybody freeze. I'm almost done. Freeze, freeze, freeze. There's a group of people up here who'd happy to pray with you. As we go from here, there's a Saltbox Connect lunch. If you want to find out more, become a member, ask questions, that's great. We're launching small groups this week. If you're not in one, you can come Thursday night at our offices, which are on our website, 630 to 830. And if you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I would love to pray with you. I'll be right here next to Tim. He'd love to pray with you too. We'll lead you into the first step of this beautiful Jesus journey. As you walk out of here today, walk out asking for a deeper, fuller, broader revelation of this Father and let him impact you and change you again and again and again. Go with Jesus. Amen.